Hey everybody, my name is Kyla. Welcome to my channel where I talk about the stock market and the economy amongst other things. Today I'm going to be talking about how data isn't real. Things are really weird right now. That's probably the only thing that anybody should be saying with any sort of certainty. The Fed is still planning to rip rates. Inflation is not where we want it to be. And parts of the economy are rebalancing, as Mary Daly highlighted in her interview last week. There's going to be a lot of pressure points on consumers moving forward too. Stimulus checks ended, even though there's evidence that that's still working its way through the economy, the student loan payments are starting back up, auto loans are teetering off the edge of a cliff, and mortgage rates have skyrocketed. There's this very brief philosophical side that I want to touch on because I think it'll help set the tone for this piece. This is Idea Respectable by Guy Debord. He walks through a lot of what is happening today. So the first sentence of this book, which I recommend you read, is in societies where modern conditions of production prevail, life is presented as an immense accumulation of spectacles. Everything that was directly lived has receded into a representation. We have a world world where we are pretty disconnected from the things that we own. We really have no idea why or how or even who made the thing. Like I have no idea who made Tiny Mike that no longer has the clip to make it not sound as bad. We're completely separate from the process of the products that we end up consuming. That creates this weird element of cognitive dissonance where there, we're then separated from the moral choice of the products that we end up consuming. If we truly saw the conditions of places like Shein that make clothes in, we probably wouldn't buy that shirt, right? We'd look at that and be like, ooh. <laughs> but because we are separated, both morally and emotionally alienated from the things that we exist around. We end up projecting value onto those things as social instruments, as signaling tools. As Stephen West highlights in his podcast about Guy Debord, social appearances mean more to us about something's value than substance does. The illusion matters more to us than the truth. The exchange value of an item in the marketplace matters more to us than anything to do with its use value. How things appear as an appearance is more important than how they appear in reality. A spectacle is not a collection of images, but a social relation among people mediated by images. Right now in our economy, we have a mess on our hands. The data isn't reflective of reality. Companies are fluffing out earnings. The Fed is using a toolkit that maybe has not a strong connection to reality. Most of all, we beef with words without understanding the underlying concept. But this gets into data and reality. There's so many questions, right? The US CPI forecasts are usually very wrong. It's very hard to forecast things. We can't really agree what's going on with GDP. And our job opening is the right thing to look at to gauge the success of the labor market. Nobody really knows. We have all these data, we have all these numbers, but we still have really no idea what's going on and that's just how it is right like you can't can't get mad <laughs> it's just how it is economics is an art not a science but there are two points here we need data that is comprehensive and representative some of the numbers that we look at are neither of those survey data in terms of data being comprehensive the survey data that we have people aren't really responding to anymore which makes the data more volatile mar making markets more volatile causing uncertainty to rise in this endless loop of weight what's real and what isn't. Nobody knows. And then in labor market data, in terms of data being representative, there's data saying that the labor market is actually isn't doing that well, that job postings are declining more than the labor department reports of job openings. But that's not great, right? There's this disconnect. Employee America has done a bunch of, I talk about them all the time. They've done a bunch of amazing work on how job openings aren't even a good metric to look at. We should look at quits instead. And it's good to have data to pull from, but when the data becomes not very comprehensive and not very representative, that creates a series of issues because we're using different survey and labor market metrics to gauge these policy decisions or market response, but it isn't really a comprehensive or truly representative look at what's going on. And that is highly problematic, right? This is going to be a little contentious, but inflation might not be that bad. The weirdest thread to pull on is what we think about what the data is telling us might not actually be what the data is. Inflation might not be that bad of a thing, actually. <laughs> and I know it's obviously not good. Like that is a very broad statement. The levels that we have now are completely unsustainable, but there are benefits to inflation, right? There's inflation wage gains. So finally, because we've had inflation, there are signs that lower wage workers are finally getting an upper hand with respect to wage gains with lower earners earning the biggest pay raises versus high earners during this time. However, wealth disparity still rages. The top incomes in the U.S. have surged, driven by capital gains, realization, and business profits. The income share of the top 1% now far exceeds from the previous peak of 1928. There's also corporate pricing power. Because there's like all this worry about a wage price spiral and not a lot of focus on the price price spiral, right? Where as companies are continuing to raise prices, putting more and more pressure on the consumer. We're like, hey guys, you're getting paid a little too much out here. As company, you know, Campbell's Soup is charging 16% more per quarter. We're worried about wage price spirals and people are finally getting paid more, at least nominally with inflation as that forcing function for companies to be like, oh, you know, yeah, maybe we should pay them a little bit more. And maybe not paying attention to this sleeping dragon of price, price spirals, a term that Lael Brainerd 
coined in reference to companies raising prices and that be also you know a big cause of inflation another interesting example of what the data is telling us might not always be what we thought it was as guy berger highlighted in a bloomberg interview the number of folks working multiple jobs is paradoxically a pro-cyclical indicator however however grain of salt everybody the underlying idea being that as the labor markets improve it's a good thing that people can find a second job. It's not a good thing that they have a second job, right? Ideally, they'd get compensated more, not need to have to take on extra work. But it just shows that there's many ways to slice and dice the data that we see. How that we look at the data isn't always representative of the reality that we exist in. And there's company fluff. Companies are fluffing out those numbers to try and make earnings look good. And this is bad, of course, <laughs> but it's good for the market. Whatever is good for the stock market, it's good for the world, right? I've mentioned this FT article to so many people at this point, but I found this line so striking because it's so true. We're in a society where it is easier to protect shareholder rights than civil rights. Of course we are, but we are obsessed with this appearance of his appearances that Guy Debord talks about in his work. We're molding reality to whatever narrative the stock market wants it to have that day. We are short-term garbage raccoons chasing infinite, ever dollar signs that we will never reach, right? And this is where that wage price spiral versus the price price spiral is really important. Companies are raising prices to try and manage the cost of running a company in a high inflation period, but we need to recognize that those elements are creating pressure for consumers, and of course they have to prices to pay people. They're raising prices a lot. <laughs> that endless chase, the reason that they're doing it is to protect margins, right? That endless chase of profitability and margin could hurt people more than the Fed's toolkit ever could. And that misaligned focus with number go up creates all these long-term problems for us. Of course, companies have always fluffed out numbers, but as this Bloomberg piece highlights, the pressure on these leadership teams is intense. If you're getting ready to release your earnings and you can move a penny around somewhere from left to right, it just might tell a better story that as long as it's legal, they'll do it. So even even what companies are reporting and their stock price movement relative to that isn't really real. It's real in the sense that it's a narrative, but the long-term consequences of juicing will likely outweigh the short-term benefit. And then finally, the Fed toolkit. Philip Jefferson, a member of the Fed, said changing the 2% inflation target that the Fed has could call into question the FOMC's commitment to stabilizing inflation at any level. It might lead people to suspect that the target could be changed opportunistically in the future. The Fed is concerned with the appearances of appearances. And one thing that people will likely get mad at me at for saying, but it's fundamentally true. The Fed is doing what they can with what they have. They're doing their job, right? Should they have moved faster? Sure, totally. Anybody could have gone back in time and told the Fed to do that. Was, were people telling the Fed to do that at the time? Of course, but nobody knew what was going on. What the heck were they moving with too, right? Like the toolkit that they have. Interest rate hikes are a fine tool, but the Fed is throwing uncooked spaghetti at the wall and trying to see if it's going to stick. They're like, sure, we'll raise rates between five to five and quarter percent and hold there. Like maybe that'll work. And the real tool it is the psyop that they do and you know the focus of the dot plot as Neil Kashkari highlighted it's not about what they will do it's about what they signal that they'll do and the Fed's job and it's an important one is to run a psychological operation on the economy to make sure that people and markets are pricing in what the Fed wants them to price in 20% of the economy is getting beaten to a pulp by the Fed the interest rate sensitive components like mortgages and auto loans but the other 80% is moving and grooving at least according to the data so the Fed is tightening into this world that isn't really responding to it and there's more work is that they're taking a hammer to the economic wall rather than the inflation nail. So they're saying, boom, 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 uh, we're going to hit something maybe, and rather than more targeting the nail that they're, they're, they're trying to hit. Mm -hmm. The Fed is dealing with economic reality, but with a toolkit that can only do so much. I talked about it a lot. So many other people have talked about it a lot, but there has to be other policy implemented, like support for the labor market from fiscal policy to help the Fed achieve their goals. The final thread to pull on it, and this like society of the spectacle conversation is our fascination with words instead of concepts. So there was a poll stating that 71% of Americans think that we should spend more on assistance to the poor, but if you call it welfare, only 30% agree. Oh, we get so lost in the sauce and we just get in our own way so often. Bern Hobart had a really good tweet about this. A great theory I heard about this in reference to something else, but was that 19th century written communication had a long lag time, so it had to be very clear and had to be good at modeling somebody's mental state based on, based on their writing. Lower latency communication means that we get much less practice. And I think the line modeling someone's mental state is really important here because if you go back to the society of the spectacle, a big concept there is that we are so far removed from everything, from understanding how our water gets out of our faucets to how our clothes are made. If you extrapolate that, we just don't spend much time having to be empathetic to the products that we exist around, to the world that we exist around, right? Because we don't really practice those faculties that often. We're not like required to do so. We don't model somebody's mental state very often, especially in writing. And that creates this weird gap between understanding what welfare 
and assistance to the poor means. We can't really agree on what reality is, which is what Guy's whole piece was about. Elon Musk, just as another example, is recruiting a team to build an anti-woke AI. And like, if you think that's a good idea, sure. If you think it's a bad idea, sure. But if you had to ask people to define what that meant, I don't think anybody would really know because it's existing in the inverse of something else. But then also, what is wokeism, you know? So like, there's all these questions and people should do what they want. And if you want anti-woke AI, like go for it. But it just ties into the war really well. Men just detach from every aspect of life, merge into a common stream, and the former unity of life is lost forever. Apprehended in a partial way, reality unfolds in a new generality and a swayed world apart solely as an object of contemplation. In terms of how we should approach data not being representative or comprehensive of reality, I think that sentiment is a good gauge. I did a piece for Bloomberg Opinion talking about how trends like de-influencing can tell us a lot about how the younger generation is feeling, how people are feeling, and Fed members are, you know, constantly out there speaking to their communities. So I think all of this is factored in, right? I think people are like, yeah, we know that the data isn't quite there and like talking to people is key. But we're most definitely in a grain of salt economy. Data is not definitive, but it is a tool meant to be used in conjunction with other tools. It's not a final painting, but rather the strokes on a canvas that requires to step back, take a closer look, and really reflect on narrative reality and interpretation. Thanks so much for hanging out. Thanks so much for spending time with me. Hope y'all are doing okay out there. I'll be back next week. Have some exciting projects coming up, of course. If you want to go ahead and hit subscribe, that super duper helps. And I'll see y'all soon and hope you're doing okay. Bye.